Hi Church family, welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study and I'm getting used to this lockdown uh, video Bible study. It's quite an interesting way of teaching. Um, I'm in my dining room, at my dining room table, surrounded by my computers and my work and my homeschool stuff from the kids and it's all kind of crazy. If you hear guinea pigs uh, eating their food or cars raving past, then that's uh, a sign of life around us. We continue with Romans chapter 5, which we um, are reading from Romans chapter 5 onwards in our Bible study. And uh, we've kind of skipped over Romans chapters 1 through 4, which will feature as we, as we go along. But um, it's quite nice to jump in at chapter 5 when you study the book of Romans and refer back to chapters 1 to 4 as we go along. But I also invite you to do your own personal study of Romans chapters one through four. So Romans is a book written, uh, a letter written by Paul to the church at Rome. The church obviously had some difficulties with Jews and Gentile, Jewish and Gentile Christians, sort of having some differences of opinion. So one of the features of this early church was tr trying to work out what it meant to follow Jesus and, and to receive Jesus' uh, grace and, and this message to the Gentiles but also to incorporate their understanding of the law and the importance of the Old Testament law to to the people of Israel, to the Hebrew people. And so what would happen in these early churches, they would start in a synagogue and Paul would preach and, and people would come and come come to faith. Uh, and then Gentiles would join and then the the Hebrews, the, the Jewish Christians would sort of um, uh, maybe be a bit jealous of, of the grace offered to these Jews gentile uh, christians because because there wasn't really such a thing as christian it was like a sect within Juda judaism at the time and so the jewish christians the hebrew christians um understood themselves as kind of having having pride of place in these communities but also what was difficult was was that through the grace of God and and through the holy spirit they came to realize that the dietary laws weren't as important as as they had been held to be, that there was a new dispensation of God's grace and, and a new kingdom of God that wasn't the, the return of God's kingdom to Israel as the disciples had hoped when Jesus died, but that was a kingdom that spread out into all the world and a new dominion kingdom uh, reign of God that was to be described. So we continue with chapter 5 verse 12 and uh, before we begin we pray. Loving God, we ask that through your Holy Spirit you would help us to understand beyond the words of a preacher and even beyond the words of Scripture to what it is that your Holy Spirit has to say to us as your people today. Help each of us through your Holy Spirit to hear that one message that you have for each of us personally so that we can become the people that you called, created us to be. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, last week we started with chapter 5, and chapter 5 in verse 1 really introduces uh, itself as a new, a new phrase, a new phase in the book of Romans that will go from chapters 5 through to 8. And whenever we see that word therefore, we know that it refers to what the argument that came before, and it's now going to build on that argument. And when you read Romans, you can see that the argument that's going to come now from chapters 5 onwards is an argument or a, or a description of, of what it means to live in the grace of God that has been described through from chapters 1 to 4. And we'll go on until we find out what it means to be a new community in Christ and, and what kind of church God wants for, for the world. So in response to the grace of God, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, and this is this belonging to the kingdom of God, we're talking to a Jew and a Gentile, we can imagine them. Now in chapter 5, Paul seems to sort of focus on his Jewish audience, um, continuing to convince them that the Gentiles can belong, but he's speaking to both of them. And because we've been justified through faith, we've, we've got this free access and we've got faith uh, and, and access to God, we, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That uh, verse, verse 2, rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God, reminds us back of chapter 3, verse 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
and now we know that we can be returned to that glory of God. Now remember the glory of God that we fall short of is not pleasing God, but reflecting God. We're created in God's image. That image is tarnished and messed up by sin in the world. We are justified through faith because of what Christ has done. By his wounds we're healed. Those kinds of understandings. And now we can have hope that we will be turned into the people that we're meant to be. And even though there's going to be suffering and, and, and struggle, we're never disappointed. Like Psalm 22 verse 5, to you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. We're never disappointed because God has poured his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. And this healing love that God pours into our hearts every day by the Holy Spirit, you can just go past that verse quickly and say, oh, that's lovely. The Spirit pours out love into our hearts and, and that's very nice. But but we need to understand that this is a costly process, that God's love is poured out. It is coming from somewhere. It's just like the language that's used for the blood of Jesus being spilt out. The Holy Spirit pours out love, God's love, love that belongs to God, into our hearts like it is costly to love somebody and lifts us up and transforms us. We will not be disappointed in our hope because God is pouring his love into our hearts. We are becoming the loving people that we're created to be in love, by love, for love, by God, to become the people that we ought to be in the world. And we continue just reflecting on this beautiful grace that's offered to us in chapter 5. At the right time, we're still powerless and helpless. We didn't have that love. Christ died for the ungodly. The love poured out through the gate of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for us comes into our hearts and starts to transform us. We have been justified by his blood. He spent this great amount of money, so to speak, this, this great grace on us to save us. And so we will be reconciled and transformed. Another word that often gets confused in the scripture is this notion of God's wrath, saved from God's wrath. And there's this idea that can easily come as we anthropomorphize, isn't that a nice big word, uh, as, we, as we make God look more like a human in our minds, that we think that God would be, be wrathful like a human is wrathful, sort of bent on revenge and anger and storming about and just wanting to cause pain to people because he's grumpy. But this is not what God's wrath is like. It's sort of, we've taken a, a word for, for a kind of God's righteous um, anger or the, the righteous results of all the pain that we've caused others and the, the justice of God and, and humanized it a bit to think that God's storming around like a, like a raging bull in a china shop. That's not God's way. God's way is love and justice. And so we're spared this, this wrath, this justice for our sins because Christ has taken it upon himself the consequences of our sin and so we see Christ experiencing the consequence of our sin when he dies for us on the cross. We rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received reconciliation. So we're beginning to understand what Paul is painting. It's a, a beautiful picture of a, a new understanding of all the world that we must understand where sin is defeated and God's grace and love prevails. So for the Jew who is listening to this, um, to this passage, his idea is that in the world everything's divided up and there's a tribe of people, a, a, a nation of people who are God's chosen ones, who will be the ones who will, who will bring God's goodness into the world. But Paul is helping this person or us to see that, that, that God's love is not just in them, but God's love through Christ has come into all the world and turned all of the world upside down and changed the scene completely. There is a new dominion. There is a new reign. There is a new um, a kingdom in place. And this kingdom, this gospel news, which remind you that when when you speak of an evangelist, a euangelionist, someone who would go and preach the gospel, there would be somebody who would announce that a king has conquered another kingdom and there's a new ruler in town. There's a new government in place and that government is going to be just and the prisoners are going to be set free. The prisoners that were wrongly condemned and wrongly uh, arrested because they resisted the, the evil of the previous king, they're going to be set free and there's going to be a new, a new dispensation. So all of this in our heads, um, Paul describes the way that 
the, the Jew would have seen the world. Just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. So it's interesting when you read the Old Testament that this idea of, of fall doesn't really come from the Old Testament. That sounds confusing. Adam and Eve choose the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but it's never described in the Old Testament as as this great moment through which sin entered the world. But Paul is now describing this as sin entering the world through this one man and death through sin. And so this understanding that, that Adam and Eve had eternal life, but when they made their decision to be disobedient to God, death came. Now we realize that death came and the banishment from the Garden of, 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 of Eden came because God didn't want Adam and Eve in their, in their eternal state um, in, in their sinful state to partake of the tree of the fruit uh, of eternal life that would have locked them into that state forever. Instead, death enters because of sin uh, and death enters because of God as a, as a way of ending the uh, giving people a sort of terminal life instead of an eternal life so that God's purposes can be worked out. And we realize also back in Genesis, all those prophetic words that we read uh, around Christmas time during Advent, we remember in the service of lessons and carols the, this promise that that uh, the the heel will crush the head of the serpent. All of these these image, all of this imagery that God's life is going to come into the world. And now, in Romans, Paul is trying to um, put words, very brief words, uh, around what it means to say this. So. He has this world that is full of sin, and in verse 14, death is reigning from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. So to say that death reigns from the time of Adam to the time of Moses is to speak about how even without the law, death continued to exist in the world because of sin. So there's this phenomenon of sin, of being in a, a sinful world, and there is the legality of sin. And Paul seems to, to speak about the two in two separate streams. There's one that's kind of going to have the, 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 the judicial, the legal results. If you, if you sin because there's a command, you, you know that you've sinned and you've broken the command. But there's also the status of sin that exists whether or not you know there's a law or not. So your deeds, law or not, you know that they cause harm or they cause good. Uh, Abraham in faith, chose good. But as you read Abraham's life, you see that he did some strange things. Uh, but at that stage, there wasn't law except those commands that God gave him as he went along. And he worked it out in relationship and in faith. As this new church was wont to do, as, as the Holy Spirit inspired them, suddenly there's, there's no law, but there is the law of the Spirit of God in the heart, which Paul will speak about later, and I mustn't get there too soon. So there's this law. Sin is not taken into account, but it's still there. It's not reckoned. It's not put against your account. It's not named. It's still there. And even if sins, modern sins, are not named in the Bible, they're still sins because they still rob people of their life and they, they rob people of the will of God for humanity. And, and so there's so much confusion there. So those, so in verse 14, this this death reigns from from Adam to Moses, even though there's no law. Uh, so I sometimes say that the that evil is 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 the opposite of life. So evil is spelled is live spelled backwards. Anything that robs us of life is evil. So it's an interesting thing that's happened recently. There's a, a, a satanic church in Cape Town, and the media is is amazed by this. And I'm not sure what they stand for. I haven't read the articles or anything. I'm just uh, amused because I know that that the the satanic movement is a like a carnival distraction from the true nature of evil in the world. Evil doesn't look like somebody with piercings and a and a, a big tattoo over his head and an upside down cross and a and a magic star or something behind them. Evil looks like uh, injustice. Evil looks like um, billionaires floating around on yachts while people starve to death 
in, in townships. Evil looks like so much of the world that we live in today. Uh, and the devil would love you to believe that that evil is, is a kind of a satanic church. But evil's probably more more in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange and all these, all these uh, vast uh, temples of greed that we have in the world that, that rob people of, of life. Again, I digress. But death exercises dominion because of evil. Even over those who, whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who is a type of the one who is to come. So this word type or tupos or typology, uh, it doesn't equate the existence of Adam with the existence of Jesus, as if uh, Adam's existence was the grounds for everything to happen. To understand Adam as a type, he's kind of like a mold, uh, the first human. It's important when you read Adam in Romans to realize that that what Paul is emphasizing because of the Jewish belief is that all people belong to this one giant human family, all descendants of Adam, all have sin in them because Adam has sin, all sin independently of Adam. Their sins are not like Adam, but they continue to sin and bring death into the world. And so that sin is is something that we have all, all done. We all uh, are dominated by that sin. What is also understood by this is that that like Adam submitted to the temptation, Jesus resisted temptation um, and Jesus made the better choice. And Jesus went to the cross uh, to die for our sins. Um, so instead of being like Adam who would choose according to his nature and what he desired, Christ chose the way of the cross. And so we realize that the free gift like it goes on and this is again the point of this is is not to build a theology forever of 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 what this means. You've got to hold all of these scriptures together to understand the theology of the New Testament. But what Paul is helping his reader to understand is that the world is no longer dominated by evil, um, by, by the impossibility of redemption, by this trudging work of, of, of legalism uh, to, to make one righteous. But now the world has freedom and the possibility of grace because of Christ's right choice. So uh, Adam is not a god. Um, Adam is, is, is just a somebody back there in history, uh, an understanding of, of the typical way of, of all human beings. We all don't quite see the snake in our branches and we all listen to the snake instead of to our God and we all think that we're not good enough and we all choose to eat the fruit and we mess things up like that way in our various ways. Uh, so Adam is like a type of all of us, an archetype of all of us. Christ, on the other hand, um, is God. And and so how much more is this great argument that's going to keep coming up in um, Romans chapter 5? How much more then does Jesus Christ's grace abound for the many? And I'm switching back from the New Revised Standard Version to the uh, New International Version. Uh, and just to pick up that language, I just like that language. God's grace, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by that grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. So this grace that Paul is arguing about and putting forward is a grace that is more than enough for those who need it. More than enough to, to, to overturn the evil that Adam did. It, it overflows. It's abundance of grace. And, and when you think of those stories of grace in the New Testament, like Jesus feeding the 5,000, it's not just about um, multiplying bread so that there's enough to eat. It's a story about how there's enough grace for all the people because Christ God has enough compassion for all the people. Again, 
the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trans trespasses and brought justification. So what Christ has done, the gift of God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life, is so much greater than the sin of Adam. Uh, and like you just have to think about it for a little bit to understand what that means. That Christ's offering for us is so much more than Adam's fumbling. Christ's offering for us is, is no mistake. It's no, no unplanned uh, foible of weakness. But it is God's act of power that is so much greater than Adam's one sin. And so that one act of God in Christ is so much more than the result of one man's sin. So you can know, and I can know, that I am not irredeemable, that you are not irredeemable. You are able to receive life through Christ no matter how far you've fallen. Because one man's sin can never be as great as God's choice to offer his life for you. We continue to speak about how this new reign has entered the world that Paul wants his readers to understand. There's a new dominion. There's a new power at work. And all of these words like power and dominion, they, they're so negatively uh, framed because of the evil of those who hold power in the world and the corruption of things. But the understanding is that this power is God power. This, this kingdom is God's kingdom. This kingdom is one where Jesus reigns. Jesus has all authority and wins over all of our evil. And so we can move from this kingdom where death reigned through that one silly man, Adam, uh, or that one silly person, Angus, or that one silly thing you did, that one mistake you made, or that mistake you continue to make, death reigned through that, through you, through what you did. But how much more, he goes on, will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Those are big words. Those are, are huge concepts. We thought that we were doomed to sin. We thought that there was no hope for us. We thought that there was no hope for the world. And, and we can, we're likely to think like that at this time. Uh, with COVID going on and just economic disaster and, and, and the possibility of poverty and, and job losses, and we could lose all of our hope in humanity. But although we might lose our hope in humanity, in Christ, we have hope. We have hope that is greater than sin because of God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness that helps us to reign in life, that, that gives us the victory in life. And that doesn't mean that you will be uh, victorious as in rich and powerful and strong and all of those things. But that means that that Adam nature in you, that sin nature, can be defeated. It can be beaten out by God's righteousness, by God's gift. The power of the cross, the power of Christ on the cross, is so much greater than the power of sin that sometimes reigns in us. And we know what that sin produces. It produces impatience and anger and, and greed and covetousness and dissatisfaction and all of those things that make this time so much more difficult. The gift of righteousness that comes through Christ produces the fruit of the Holy Spirit, allows us to become transformed, to have a new attitude and a, and a different sense of what is most important at a time that is so difficult. 
consequently goes on Paul. As the result of one trespass was condemnation for all people, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all people. As through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. As we get to verse 18 through 21, Paul is really just summarizing what he said in the whole of chapter 5. Receiving justification. As opposed to what Adam did, Christ chose obedience, Adam chose disobedience. And then to help his listener understand the purpose of the law in everything and understand why you can be made right with God apart from the law, he refers back to the law in verse 20. The law was added so that the trespass might increase, so, so that you couldn't say that people didn't know and, and that they, they could... Uh, if, you, if you try to imagine um, God's plan in all of this, you've got the beginning where people become conscious and, and become aware of sin. You've got Abraham, who lives in Ur, where people sacrifice children to the gods and, and have this understanding of the gods as, as, as angry and, and, and wrathful and, and, and wanting humans to be slaves. Abraham steps out of that as God reveals God's self to Abraham. And Abraham starts to live a new understanding and a new kind of faith. It takes a long time for, for humans to realize what God wants for us, what God means in all of this. And so as, as the story continues, God gives us laws so that we can understand what's right and wrong. And, and when we read the, the commandments, we know that they say, uh, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Uh, this is the, the, the preface to all the laws to say, I'm the kind of God who sets you free. So if you want to be free, follow these rules. These are rules for life, for living, not for dying. So the law is added so the trespass might increase so that we can understand what it means to to be disobedient, to, to sin against God. And, and where the sin increased, grace increased all the more. So as evil as people were in, in Romans chapter 1 through 2, that just describe just how bad we sometimes get and perhaps not even that bad not not even enough to describe it but it all works out pretty terrible just how how, how um, selfish we become God gives us more grace because the sin is no greater than the grace is is no yeah the sin is no greater than the grace because this world was created in love by love in grace by God who is revealed to us perfectly in Jesus, who is able to bring us redemption and wholeness and healing, so that just as sin reigned in death, also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that begin, brings us to the end of chapter 5. And next week we continue in chapter 6. Uh, thank you for letting me talk so long, and I pray that... Um, this word would be blessed to our understanding and our lives. And uh, please feedback via Facebook or via uh, email or via um, the YouTube comments. And I'll try to respond. Uh, it would be nice if I could respond in the videos to, to any of your questions about the book of Romans and what we're learning. And uh, it is always nice if someone says, hey, I don't understand that. Or hey, I disagree with that. Or what do you think that really means? Or why is that there? I'd love to engage with you as much as I am possible, as it is possible. So let's pray. Loving God, thank you for the new reality that comes to, to bear on the world through Christ. Our world is not governed by Adam's mistake, Adam's sin. But our world is governed by you, Jesus, and your victory over death and your righteousness and your decision to to love us so much that you'd go to the cross for us and we know that even on the cross you 
your righteousness was not defeated. And on the third day you rose again. On ascension day you rose up to be seated at the right hand of the Father. And Lord, we live in hope that will not disappoint us. Knowing that even though sometimes we backslide and fall away, your grace is enough to lift us up, to redeem us, to rescue us, and to set us on the right path again. Be with us and help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.